Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina and this is my lecture on surgical complications in pregnancy. To download this lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. These are my main references for this lecture. This is, this is the outline of my lecture. So first, to be able to understand how difficult it is to manage surgical complications during pregnancy, we must understand some physiologic changes during pregnancy. And then we move on to discussing some of the most common surgical complications seen during pregnancy. We also discuss the proper way to do CPR in pregnant women. And lastly, we discuss some of the merits of laparoscopy in pregnancy. So many surgical and obstetrical complications may be encountered in pregnancy or the puerperium. It is important that obstetricians and other members of the healthcare team have a working knowledge of the unique considerations for pregnant women, including pregnancy-induced physiologic changes, alterations in normal laboratory values, and consideration, of course, for the fetus. Because these women are usually young and in good health, their prognosis is generally better than, than many other patients admitted to the ICU. You. So we discuss here some important physiologic changes in pregnancy. So fetal development and maternal maintenance of pregnancy require multi-organ physiological adaptations and this include number one, cardiac output increase to about 30 to 50 percent and this is due to the increase in stroke volume and the increase in maternal heart rate. There's also a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance due to increase in several endogenous vasodilators such as progesterone, estrogen, and nitric oxide which leads to a decrease in mean arterial pressure. Also, the enlarging uterus can produce increased afterload through compression of the aorta and a decrease in cardiac return through compression of the inferior vena cava starting at 12 to 14 weeks AOG. And as a result, the supine position, which is most favorable for resuscitation, can lead to hypotension. So this is the reason why when we do CPR, we usually place the pregnant patient in a left lateral decubitus position. So what is the basis for placing this patient in a left lateral decubitus position? A magnetic resonance imaging study comparing the maternal hemodynamics in the left lateral position with those in the supine position was performed. And they found out that at 20 weeks AOG, there is significant increase in ejection fraction of about 8% and stroke volume of about 27% in the left lateral position. And at 32 weeks AOG, there is significant increase in the ejection fraction about 11%. There's also an increase in the end diastolic volume, increase in stroke volume, and of course, increase in the cardiac output in the left lateral position. Uteroplacental blood flow also increases close to 1,000 ml per minute during pregnancy and receiving up to a maximum of 20% of maternal cardiac output at term. There's also expanded intravascular volume and a decrease in uterine vascular resistance that facilitates sufficient uterine placental blood flow. Uterine vascular reactivity is also altered, characterized by reduced tone, enhanced vasodilation, and blunted vasoconstriction. For the lungs, functional residual capacity decreases by 10 to 25% during pregnancy as the uterus enlarges and elevates the diaphragm. There's also increased ventilation beginning in the first trimester reaching a level of 20 to 40% above baseline by term. This produces a mild respiratory alkalosis with compensatory renal excretion of bicarbonate resulting in an arterial carbon dioxide pressure of about 28 to 32 mm Hg and a plasma bicarbonate level of 18 to 21 mex per liter. Oxygen consumption increases because of the demands of the fetus and maternal metabolic processes. The reduced functional residual capacity reservoir and increased consumption of oxygen is due to the rapid development of hypoxemia in response to hypoventilation or apnea in the pregnant woman. Upper airway edema and friability also occurs as a result of hormonal effects and may reduce visualization during laryngoscopy and increase the risk of bleeding. 
For the kidneys, there is glomerular hyperfiltration and increased renal blood flow by about 40%. And this is to accommodate the maternal role of fetal detoxification of metabolic byproducts and maintenance of maternal osmoregulation in the face of increased circulatory intravascular volume. There is also altered tubular function that prevents wasting of glucose, amino acids, and proteins required by both maternal and fetal metabolism. For the GI tract, progesterone relaxes gastroesophageal sphincters and prolongs transit times throughout the intestinal tract during the second and third trimesters, predisposing the patient to aspiration of stomach contents. Drug metabolism is also altered by several different mechanisms in pregnancy. Steroid-induced steroid acceleration of the hepatic P450 metabolism and increased renal clearance will also lower circulating drug levels. Here are some important formulas for deriving various cardiopulmonary parameters. And for pregnant women, MAP or the mean arterial pressure is the most important clinically. And this is how we compute the mean arterial pressure. So we get the systolic blood pressure uh, plus 2 times of the diastolic blood pressure divided by 3. So for example, if we want to compute the MAP of 150 over 70, that's 150 plus 70 times 2, that's 140. So 150 plus 140 is 290. So divided by 3, that is 96.67 and then we round that off to 100. So let us now discuss some of the most common surgical emergencies during pregnancy such as appendicitis, cholecystitis or cholelithiasis, and trauma. So first let's discuss appendicitis. Appendicitis one of the most common indications for abdominal exploration during pregnancy is appendicitis. However, pregnancy makes the diagnosis of appendicitis more difficult and this is because nausea and vomiting accompany normal pregnancy. And there's also some degree of leukocytosis that accompanies normal pregnancy. And, and as the uterus enlarges, the appendix commonly moves upward or is deflected upward and outward from the right lower quadrant. And that's the reason why clinical examination of a pregnant patient for appendicitis is quite difficult because the appendix is displaced upward. Pregnant women, especially those late in gestation, frequently do not have typical findings for appendicitis. Thus, it is commonly confused with cholecystitis, preterm labor, pyelonephritis, renal colic, placental abruptio, or uterine lymioma degeneration. And this is because of the fact that the appendix is deflected upward and outward during pregnancy, more so for those late in gestation. Most reports indicate increasing morbidity and mortality rates with increasing gestational age. And as the appendix is progressively deflected upward by the growing uterus, or mental containment of infection becomes increasingly unlikely. Appendicial perforation is also more common during later pregnancy. Persistent abdominal pain and tenderness are the most reproducible findings for patients or pregnant patients with appendicitis. Right lower quadrant pain is the most frequent, although pain migrates upward with appendicial displacement. For evaluation, sonographic abdominal imaging is reasonable in suspected appendicitis, even if to exclude an obstetrical cause of right lower quadrant pain. Appendicial MRI or computed tomography is more sensitive and accurate than sonography to confirm suspected appendicitis during pregnancy. Using a decision analysis model, CT and MRI were found to be the most cost-effective. When appendicitis is suspected, treatment is prompt surgical exploration. Although diagnostic errors may lead to removal of a normal appendix, surgical evaluation is preferable to postponed intervention and generalized peritonitis. In earlier reports, the, the diagnosis was verified in only 60 to 70 percent of pregnant women. However, as indicated above with CT and MRI or MRI these figures have already improved and what importantly importantly the accuracy of diagnosis is inversely proportional to gestational age what does this mean it means that if the pregnant patient is in a later gestational age or in a in a more advanced gestational age it is more difficult to diagnose appendicitis 
Laparoscopy is almost always used to treat suspected appendicitis during the first two trimesters. Before expiration, intravenous antimicrobial therapy is begun, usually with a second-generation cephalosporin or third-generation penicillin. Unless there is gangrene, perforation, or a periependitial phlemon, antimicrobial therapy can usually be discontinued after surgery. Without generalized peritonitis, the prognosis is usually excellent. Seldom do we need to do cesarean delivery at the time of appendectomy. However, uterine contractions tend to be common because this is appendicitis. It's a form of infection. So some clinicians recommend tocolytic agents. However, there is a caveat to this because tocolytic use substantially increases the risk for pulmonary permeability edema caused by sepsis syndrome. Appendicitis also increases the likelihood of abortion or preterm labor, especially if there is peritonitis. Long-term complications, though, are not very common. The possible link between sepsis and neonatal neurological injury has not been verified. Appendicitis during pregnancy does not appear to be associated with subsequent infertility. How about postpartum acute appendicitis? Although new onset appendicitis during the immediate porperium is uncommon, in some women it is undiagnosed before delivery. Appendicitis in these women often stimulated labor and when the large uterus rapidly empties, it was the wall of infection may be disrupted to result in an acute surgical abdomen. In some cases, acute appendicitis or a periependitial abscess or phlemon may be found at the time of cesarean delivery or puerperal tubal ligation. It is important to remember that puerperal pelvic infections typically do not cause peritonitis. Next is cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. The incidence of cholecystitis during pregnancy is reported to be about 1 in 1,000. There is no doubt that pregnancy is lithogenic. So after the first trimester, the gallbladder fasting volume as well as the residual volume after postprandial emptying are doubled. Incomplete emptying may result in retention of cholesterol crystals, a prerequisite for cholesterol gallstones. The incidence of biliary sludge, which can be a forerunner to gallstones and gallstones in pregnancy, are 31 and 2% respectively. Postpartum, there is frequently a regression of the sludge, and occasionally gallstones will resorb. Still, after delivery, hospitalization for gallbladder disease within a year remains relatively common. Biliary sludge, which may increase during pregnancy, is an important precursor to gallstone formation. That's the reason why pregnancy is known to be lithogenic. Prophylactic cholecystectomy, however, is not warranted for asymptomatic stones. But for symptomatic gallstone disease, non-surgical approaches have been used, including the use of oral bile acid therapy with orsodeoxycholic acid and the use of ESWL or extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. However, there is no experience with this during pregnancy. Acute cholecystitis usually develops when there is obstruction of the cystic duct. So bacterial infection plays a role in 50 to 85 percent of these cases. Pain is accompanied by anorexia, nausea and vomiting, low-grade fever, and mild leukocytosis. Symptomatic gallbladder disorders in young women include acute cholecystitis, biliary colic, and acute pancreatitis. In most symptomatic patients, cholecystectomy is warranted. Although acute cholecystitis responds to medical therapy, contemporary consensus is that early cholecystectomy is indicated. In acute cases, medical therapy consists of intravenous fluids, antimicrobials, analgesics, and in some instances, nasogastric suction before surgical therapy. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy has become the preferred treatment for most of our pregnant patients with cholecystitis. So how about medical versus surgical treatment for pregnant women with cholecystitis? Symptomatic cholecystitis is initially managed in a manner similar to that for non-pregnant women. In the past, most favored medical therapy. However, the recurrence rate during the same pregnancy is high and 25 to 50% of women ultimately required cholecystectomy for persistent symptoms. Moreover, if cholecystitis recurs later in gestation, preterm labor is more likely and cholecystectomy technically 
can be more difficult. And that's the reason why nowadays we favor doing cholecystectomy rather than uh, medical management. For these reasons also, operative and endoscopic interventions are increasingly favored over conservative measures. Women managed conservatively had more pain, more recurrent visits to the emergency department, more hospitalizations, and a higher rate of cesarean delivery. There's also more complications with conservative management of the gallbladder disease during pregnancy. Cholecystectomy is safely performed in all trimesters, although it is easily performed or performed more easily during the first two trimesters. No increased risk of preterm birth or fetal demise for operative compared with conservative management. We move on to trauma during pregnancy. So this includes physical abuse or intimate partner violence. The woman who is physically abused tends to present late in, in the doctor's clinic, if at all for prenatal care. Immediate sequela include uterine rupture, preterm delivery, and maternal and perinatal death. Subsequent outcomes included increased rates of placental abruptio, preterm, and low birth weight infants, and other adverse outcomes. For automobile accidents, Motor vehicle crashes are the most common causes of serious, life-threatening, or fatal blunt trauma during pregnancy. As with all motor vehicle crashes, alcohol use is commonly associated, but sadly, as many as half of accidents occur without seatbelt use, and many of these deaths would likely be preventable by the three-point restraints of seatbelts. And this is the three-point automobile restraint for seat belts. Seat belts prevent contact with the steering wheel and they reduce abdominal impact pressure. So we can see here in this diagram, this is uh, an illustration showing the correct use of the three-point automobile restraint. So the upper belt is above the uterus and the lower belt uh, fits snugly across the upper thighs and well below the uterus. Perinatal death rates increase with the severity of maternal injuries during blunt trauma. Fetal death is more likely with direct fetoplacental injury, maternal shock, pelvic fracture, maternal head injury, or hypoxia. Fetal skull and brain injuries are more likely if the fetal head is already engaged and the maternal pelvis is fractured. Fetal skull fractures are rarely seen in uh, radiographs and therefore we use CT imaging to visualize fetal skull fractures. And a sequela for this is that there's intracranial hemorrhage, paraplegia, and contractures, fetal decapitation, or incomplete mid-abdominal fetal transection at mid-pregnancy. Catastrophic events include placental injuries such as placental abruptio or placental tear and uterine rupture. Placental separation from trauma is likely caused by deformation of the elastic myometrium around the relatively inelastic placenta. And this may result from a deceleration injury as the large uterus meets the immovable steering wheel or seat belt. Clinical findings with traumatic abruptio may be similar for those for to those for spontaneous placental abruption. So the diagram on the left is a picture of acute deceleration injury which occurs when the elastic uterus meets the steering wheel. As the uterus stretches, the inelastic placenta shears from the decidua basalis and intrauterine pressures of as high as 50 mm Hg may be generated. And the picture on the right shows to us the pathophysiology of placental abruptio during blunt trauma. So this is the mechanism of placental tear or fracture caused by a deformation, reformation injury. So placental abruptio is seen as a blood collecting in the retroplacental space as seen here in this inset. Traumatic abruption may be occult and unaccompanied by uterine pain, tenderness, or bleeding. Other features are evidence of fetal compromise such as fetal tachycardia, late decelerations, and acidosis and fetal death. If there is considerable abdominal force associated with trauma, then the placenta can be torn or fractured, and life-threatening fetal hemorrhage may be encountered either into the amniotic sac or by fetomaternal hemorrhage. 
Fetal maternal hemorrhage is quantified using a clayhauer betke stain of maternal blood or the Kibi stain. With traumatic abruption, massive fetal maternal hemorrhage may coexist. So that's a 20-fold increase, increased risk of associated uterine contractions and preterm labor if there is evidence for a fetal maternal bleed. Blunt trauma results in uterine rupture in less than 1% of cases. Rupture is more likely in a previously scarred uterus and is usually associated with a direct impact of substantial force. Clinical findings may be identical to those for placental abruption with an intact uterus and maternal and fetal deterioration are soon inevitable. The primary goals are evaluation and stabilization of maternal injuries in the management of trauma. Attention to fetal assessment during the acute evaluation may divert attention from life-threatening maternal injuries. Basic rules of resuscitation include ventilation, arrest of hemorrhage, and treatment of hypovolemia with crystalloid and blood products. And of course, these also are the basic rules in a non-pregnant patient. And importantly, the large uterus should be positioned off the great vessels to diminish its effect on vessel compression and decrease cardiac output. So how do we so deflect the large uterus off the great vessels? So we call that the left uterine displacement. And in this picture, we are shown different techniques on how to displace the uterus off the great vessels. So we can do it either doing the one-handed technique, the two-handed technique, or using a board to tilt the patient towards the left. Following emergency resuscitation, evaluation is continued for fractures, internal injuries, bleeding sites, and placental, uterine, and fetal trauma. Screening abdominal sonography followed by CT scanning for positive sonographic findings is also done. Procedures used include the FAST scan. This is a focused assessment with sonography for trauma. This is a 5-minute 4-6 to six view imaging study that evaluates perihepatic, perisplenic, pelvic, and pericardial views. If fluid is seen in any of these views, then the volume is around more than 500 ml. Penetrating injuries in most cases must be evaluated using radiography because clinical response to peritoneal irritation is blunted during pregnancy, an aggressive approach to exploratory laparotomy should be pursued. Diagnostic laparoscopy is also or can also be used. Fetal well-being may reflect the status of the mother, and fetal monitoring is another vital sign that helps to evaluate the extent of maternal injuries. Even if the mother is stable, electronic fetal monitoring may suggest placental abruption. In these cases, abnormal tracings were common and includes fetal tachycardia and late decelerations that could signify fetal distress. Electronic fetal monitoring should be started as soon as the mother is stabilized. Observation for 4 hours is reasonable with the normal tracing and no other sentinel findings. Monitoring should be continued as long as there are uterine contractions, non-reassuring fetal heart rate pattern, vaginal bleeding, uterine tenderness or irritability, serious maternal injury or ruptured membranes. The necessity for cesarean delivery of a live fetus depends on several factors and this will include gestational age, fetal condition, extent of uterine injury, whether the large uterus hinders adequate treatment or evaluation of other intra-abdominal injuries. We must also ensure that maternal tetanus immunization is current. If indicated, a dose of tetanus toxoid, reduced diphtheria doxoid, and a cellular pertussis vaccine is preferred for its neonatal pertussis immunity benefits. So how do we do a proper CPR for pregnant women? There are special considerations for doing CPR conducted in the second half of pregnancy, and these are outlined in the American Heart Association Guidelines of 2010. The standards for critically ill pregnant women include Relieve possible vena cava compression by left uterine displacement or the left lateral uterine displacement. Administer 100% oxygen. Establish intravenous access above the diaphragm. Assess for hypotension that warrants therapy. Review possible causes of critical illness and treat conditions as early as possible. In a non-pregnant woman, external chest compression results in a cardiac output 
approximately 30% of normal. However, in a pregnant woman, especially a woman in late pregnancy, this may be even less with CPR because of uterine aortocaval compression. Thus, it is very, very important to accompany other resuscitative efforts with left lateral uterine displacement. Displacement or the LUD, the left uterine displacement, can be accomplished by tilting the operating table laterally by placing a wedge under the right hip, for example, in the cardioresuscitation wedge, or by pushing the uterus to the left manually if you don't have a wedge. If no equipment is available, such as an out-of-hospital arrest, an individual may kneel on the floor with the maternal back on his or her thighs to form a human wedge. Now, a closer look of the left lateral uterine displacement is seen here. So, in this picture, we use a, a wedge that we place underneath the patient so as to tilt the patient to the left by about 30 degrees. Again, if there's no wedge available, we can do it manually by either doing the one-hand technique or the two-hand technique. Here are some of the guidelines by the American Heart Association when doing CPR in a pregnant woman. First, the patient should be placed in a full left lateral decubitus position to relieve aortocaval compression as seen in this picture. Administration of 100% oxygen by face mask should be done to treat or prevent hypoxemia. Intravenous access should be established above the diaphragm to ensure that the intravenously administered therapy is not obstructed by the gravid or large uterus. Chest compression should be performed at a rate of at least 100 per minute at a depth of at least 2 inches, that's 5 centimeters, allowing full recoil before the next compression with minimal interruptions, and the patient should be placed supine for chest compressions. Hypoxemia should always be considered as a cause of cardiac arrest. Oxygen reserves are lower and the metabolic demands are higher in the pregnant patient compared with the non-pregnant patient. Thus, early ventilatory support may be necessary. The rescuer should place the heel of one hand on the center of the victim's chest and the heel of the other hand on the top of the fur so that the hands overlap and are parallel, just as seen in this picture. The same currently recommended defibrillation protocol should be used in the pregnant patient as in the non-pregnant patient. There is no modification of the recommended application of electric shock during pregnancy. The patient should be defibrillated with biphasic shock energy of 120 to 200 joules with subsequent escalation of energy output if the first shock is not effective and the device allows this option. Fetal assessment should not be performed during resuscitation. Fetal monitor should be removed or detached as soon as possible to facilitate CPR without delay or hindrance. Medication doses do not require alteration to accommodate the physiologic changes of pregnancy. Although there are changes in the volume of distribution and clearance of medication during pregnancy, these are very or there are very few data to guide changes in current recommendations. In the setting of cardiac arrest, no medication should be withheld because of concerns of fetal teratogenicity. Physiological changes in pregnancy may affect the pharmacology of medications, but there is no scientific evidence to guide a change in current recommendations. Therefore, the usual drugs and doses are recommended during CPR or ACLS in a pregnant woman. Administering 1 mg of epinephrine IV every 3 to 5 minutes during adult cardiac arrest should be considered. In view of the effects of vasopressin on the uterus and because both agents are considered equivalent, epinephrine should be the preferred agent over vasopressin. It is recommended that the current CPR or ACLS drugs at recommended doses be used without modifications. So for the last part, we discussed laparoscopic surgery during pregnancy. Laparoscopy during pregnancy has become the most common first trimester procedure used for diagnosis and the management of several surgical disorders. The most frequently performed procedures are cholecystectomy, adnexal surgery, and appendectomy. Laparoscopic adnexal mass surgery in pregnancy is preferred 
and it's relatively safe as attested by many investigators. At first, at first 26 to 28 weeks has become the upper gestational age limit re- that's recommended, but as experiences continue to accrue and improve, many now describe laparoscopic surgery performed in the third trimester. Here are some of the guidelines for the performance of laparoscopic surgery in pregnancy. So the indications are same as for the non-pregnant women. So it could include a nexal mass excision, investigation of acute abdominal processes, doing appendectomy, cholecystectomy, nephrectomy, adrenalectomy, and splenectomy. Timing, again as I've said, we can do laparoscopy in all trimesters although technically it's easier to do it during the first and second trimester but doing it in the or during the third trimester is still feasible as for the technique the position or the recommended position is a left lateral recumbent position for the entry we can do open technique or we can also do a very needle technique or optical trocar fundal height may alter insertion site selection as for the trocars, of course, as for the non-pregnant women, direct visualization for placement is always very important. Fundic height may alter insertion site selection again. CO2 insufflation pressures are recommended is around 10 to 15 mm Hg for monitoring. Of course, as in a non-pregnant woman, we use capnography intraoperatively and fetal heart rate assessment also is very important for the, for the pregnant woman during laparoscopy. Perioperative pneumatic compression devices and early postoperative ambulation are also very important. What are the hemodynamic effects of laparoscopy during pregnancy? Abdominal insufflation for laparoscopy causes hemodynamic changes that are similar in pregnant and non-pregnant women. Cardiorespiratory changes are generally not severe if insufflation pressures are kept below 20 mm Hg. Mean arterial pressure, systemic vascular resistance, and heart rate do not change significantly. Here are some physiological effects of carbon dioxide insufflation of the peritoneal cavity. So for the respiratory, there is an increase in the PCO2 and the pH also decreases. For the cardiovascular, there's increased heart rate, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary central venous pressure, and mean arterial pressure, and there is decreased cardiac output. As for the blood flow, there is decreased planktic flow with hypoperfusion of the liver, kidneys, and gastrointestinal organs, and there is decreased venous return from the lower extremities and increased cerebral blood flow. As for the technique in doing a laparoscopy during pregnancy, of course, it's very important to do bowel cleansing and because this will empty the large intestine and therefore aid in a proper visualization. Nasogastric or orogastric decompression will reduce the risk of stomach trocar puncture and aspiration. Aortocaval compression is avoided by a left lateral tilt. Positioning of the lower extremities in boot type stirrups maintains access to the vagina for fetal sonographic assessment or manual uterine displacement. Vaginally placed instruments that enter the cervix or uterus for uterine manipulation should not be used during pregnancy. Beyond the first trimester, technical modifications of standard pelvic laparoscopic entry are required to avoid uterine puncture or laceration. Many surgeons recommend open entry techniques to avoid perforations of the uterus, the pelvic vessels, and the adnexa in a pregnant woman. The abdomen is incised at or above the umbilicus. If the uterus is already very large, we usually uh, incise above the umbilicus. And the peritoneal cavity is entered under direct visualization. That's very important. At this point, the cannula is then connected to the insufflation system and the 12 mm Hg pneumoperitoneum is created. The initial insufflation should be conducted very, very slowly to allow for prompt assessment and reversal of any untoward pressure-related effects. Insertion of secondary trocars into the abdomen is most safely performed under direct laparoscopic visual observation as in a non-pregnant patient. In more advanced pregnancies, direct entry through a left upper quadrant port in the midclavicular line, that's the palmar point, 
and that's about 2 cm beneath the coastal margin. And this NT site is used in gynecological laparoscopy because visceral parietal adhesions are commonly formed here. And the picture on your right is what we call the Palmer's point, which was uh, previously discussed. What are the complications of laparoscopy during pregnancy? Actually, complications are quite rare. And the risk inherent to any abdominal endoscopy are possibly increased slightly, only very slightly during pregnancy. And the reported complications, as I've said, are very infrequent or rare. The obvious unique complication, of course, is perforation of the pregnant uterus. That's possible perforation of the pregnant uterus with either a trocar or a varus needle. So that's it. So as a review of the lecture, we discussed physiologic changes in pregnancy. We also discussed the three most common surgical complications during pregnancy. This appendicitis, cholecystitis or cholelithiasis, and trauma. We also discussed the proper way of doing CPR in a pregnant woman. And lastly, we discussed laparoscopy during pregnancy. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel Ina Irabon at my WordPress site Doc Ina Thank you.